today we're going to be talking about engaging students online. So this is um, a little bit different where we, than our, the one we did earlier in the week, which was focused just on uh, interactive lecturing. Uh, again, Tierra Costin is our voice of the chat. So if you want to um, have comments or questions, just throw so anything you want to in the chat and she can alert me if there's something I need to know or if there's a conversation going on on the side that, um, that, that would be uh, good, for, good for me to know. Uh, but please feel free to do that and also share the stuff that you've done as, you, um, as we go through the material here. What I want to uh, get done in this uh, afternoon is I just want to present some principles for engaging students online. I want to present some tips of how to do this both in Brightspace and Zoom, which are the two major platforms we're using. And then I want you all to uh, share some ideas with each other. Um, so uh, I want to start with this, and you'll recognize this from the workshop we did earlier in the week. <clears throat> this is just principles of effective online teaching. I'm going to try to ground all of our, our workshops in this um, in these principles here. But if you look at these principles, engagement, being there for the student, and having the students actually do something with the material runs through all of these, right? Student faculty contact active learning, um, uh, prompt and meaningful feedback. All these are things that engage the students in your course. So you can see that this topic is grounded in some better practices for effective online teaching. Um, there's five, for this workshop today, I, we pulled out five principles for student engagement online. And these actually came from a blog post from D2L, which is the company that owns Brightspace. Um, and so I, uh, so, so all these are really in line with our own learning management system and we can do this with our own learning management system. And the five principles that I thought would be things we could tackle now, right, in, in this uh, uh, remote teaching emergency that we're in, are communicate in multiple formats, provide active learning opportunities, gamify with like badges or awards, provide timely and useful feedback, and then improve course accessibility for all students. Now, here's where I would like to do a caveat and say, remember that we are not um, doing like perfect online teaching, right? We're, we, we did not choose this format for our courses. Our students didn't choose it. You know, online teaching can be a really, I mean, it is a really, uh, um, effective and uh, great pedagogy, but there's a lot to it, right? What we are doing, those is kind of triage and, 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 and remote teaching in this emergency situation with uh, faculty who didn't choose online teaching, students who didn't choose online teaching, and maybe uh, assignments that don't lend themselves the best. So I, I put that caveat there that we're not going to just talk about, okay, here's what you should do in the best online course. But I think these are principles that we can attend to next month, right? We have the students for one more month. And so let's attend to these, these principles. Um, the first is communicate in multiple formats, okay? This is the number one thing you can do for your students right now is stay in contact with them. Stay in contact with them about how they're doing the course, what they need for this course. Do they understand your expectations? Do they understand um, the assignments? Really, right now, they have been um, you know, scattered to the winds, and they're in all different kinds of situations, and just communicating with them is, is the best thing you can do. Um, within Brightspace, there are three ways you can communicate them to, you can communicate with them. And so, again, by doing this in multiple formats, you can hit students kind of in different ways. Of course, it's the email class list, which I'm sure we have all used, and this is in the email class list function in Brightspace. Um, you can um, go in and you can email your entire class at once, or you can choose an indivi uh, in, uh, email individual students or an individual group of students. Um, the one thing I want to say, just point out about that, is you'll notice that it always BCCs students when you email your class list, um, which is a nice practice because then um, if you're giving kind of feedback, they don't know that everybody got it. Right. Um, so using email class lists is nice too. And there are also some advanced features um, that you, in ways that you can personalize emails to students so it looks like it's coming to them uh, directly. 
Um, you can also use the advance, uh, you can, sorry, you can also use the um, discussion board as a way to communicate with students. I actually had this uh, discussion board right here set up for my class before, at the beginning of the semester, before we went even uh, started teaching remotely. And I, instead of using it as a discussion board where they get grades, I use it as a discussion board where they can just post things for each other and we can use it as a discussion. I call it my advanced researchers. Sorry. Elizabeth, you have a comment in chat. Great. Elliot is saying, I agree in principle with staying in contact, but one of my fellow students said she's been stressed out by all the emails she's getting since the crisis. Is there a good way to balance bright space announcements more, for example? Oh, that's a good question. That's the first time I've gotten that question. Um, Do you think, uh, Elliot, she's talking about your emails or just the emails from all faculty? Uh oh, you're on mute. You're, you're muted. Um, did while he's, while he's turning it off, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. I, hey, I the, space, the space bar was working earlier. Uh, yeah, I don't know. She, she, I don't think, the way she said it to me, it sounded like it was stuff from other entities more than from me, but it did make me think, gosh, I because I've been sending a lot of emails. Um, and it made me think, you know, I don't want to, A, start getting ignored and B, um, add to the stress of this. But it sounded like a lot of things from administration, um, stuff from, she said, you know, a lot of it's stuff that didn't really even apply to her. Like, I think companies are sending a lot of emails about, um, here, you know, what we're doing for you in the crisis, that kind of stuff. Um, she didn't explicitly say it was, it was my class or anything, but just that they're getting a barrage of stuff from everybody yeah. who probably means well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, maybe, uh, that's a really good point, maybe balance th that in your own courses, be sure you're not feeling like you're overdoing it in your own courses, maybe try to include as much as you can, you know, be, be as clear, right, don't be so, uh, include so much they can't read the email, but be clear in what you send out when you do that. And then also, um, but, but I also think that's probably because you mentioned this is your stellar student, right, and maybe the students more on the brink or more in the middle do need more, so. Um, and then just talk to her about ways to then uh, funnel through that, right? Amy is following up with, is there an argument for using only one method of communication with a class and being consistent with that? I told my classes to look at announcements for the class and feedback with grades. And then Jonathan followed up with, make sure they know how to set, oh, bright spaces, notifications, and how much email they're getting from that. Yep. Oh, that's a really good point. And so, Jonathan, so nice to see you, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good point. You can, if you work, if you tell them about the Pulse app, they can on their phone, they, and they can through their own individual Pulse app, decide um, how much notification, how many notifications they want. Do they want to get notified every time you post something? Like they, that's totally under their control. They get to set that up. That annoys a lot of faculty members because they want it to be automatic. If I send it, uh, announcement. I want it to go to their email, but if the students don't set it up that way, it doesn't. It is, it's under their control. They have some autonomy there. So you yeah. might, Elliot, talk to your student about that as well. We, we took kind of a mini session because uh, a lot of students, they, for somehow, for, for some reason, it, it had defaulted to not notifying them, even on the web interface for Brightspace by email. And um, so that was illuminating for them. They didn't know what that notifications thing did. So. Yep. Great, great idea. Um, yes, yeah, so I think there's the, the other question about is there an answer to consistency? I think absolutely when it comes to feedback, your grades, how, where you're going to post the assignments, like students absolutely need to know where things are, right? They need to, and they need to be able to count on that and rely on that. And the more clearer, more consistent you can be, the better. This is just ways to get them to. To, to just communicate with them in multiple different formats. Okay, so it's just ways to communicate with them, not necessarily giving them the assignments or something like that. I, but, uh, uh, I would say real. Yeah, please. Sorry, I would say real quickly. I think to answer Amy's question and also kind of bring it back to Elliot's, um, I think having some consistent some consistency is is uh, is good. Um, you know, so I've got a Tuesday Thursday class. 
and even before everything happened, I was sending them Friday emails, which kind of said, you know, here's what we did this week, and and here's what I want you to remember to do, going going ahead um, into the into the weekend because I got a lot of stuff to do kind of online, um, and then I didn't do that. I did that all semester, and I didn't do that. I think the first weekend we were shifting to online stuff because everything else going on. And I had a few students email me and say, where's, you know, where's the, where's the Friday email? Hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, th- I think, I think you can find a good balance. Um, and I tried to make that the only email I would, unless there was some kind of like emergency that I really needed to get in touch with them. That would be the only email I'd send them during the week. I like that idea of doing that. I'm just going to show you the two other ways you can communicate with them and then we can move on from this one. But I think that's really important uh, topics. And it's interesting. I wonder if this principle about communicating in multiple formats will change over the weeks as we get into this, right? Um, But for the, uh, this here, you can use a discussion board for just discussion and communication. It doesn't need to be like a discussion about an article or readings that they grade. So this is for my advanced research class. And so we've just got, if you just need to vent, put stuff in there. If you want to share something, kick in discussion board. And then I want to show you down here. uh, If you, do you know about uh, the video, add a video note feature? Will you just put it in the chat so Tia can tell me if most people know or don't know about the video note feature under insert stuff? If you'll just say yes or no in the chat. It'll tell me how long to spend on this. Yeah, two yeses thus far. All right. Two more yeses. Okay, great. So I'm not going to spend time on this. You know, then everywhere you see this like HTML editor where you can bold things and italicize things and add hyperlinks, you know that you can also click on this. Um, icon of the little box and the arrow, and that will take you a pop up this window of insert stuff. And you know, one of the things you can insert is a video note. And so this was, this is a screenshot here of an assignment by literature integration. Student could see her grade, could see this little feedback. And then in the video note, I could say, um, so, uh, um, Tira, I think you did a really good job on this, and here's what I want you to work on for next time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And they see a little, um, either an audio, I can choose an audio or a video of me. And then, especially with our students kind of being remote, I think it's nice to see each other's faces. Popping it up and letting them see your feedback through a video note is really nice. We just found out today, so video note has been capped at three minutes. We just found out today that the D2L, the company who owns Brightspace, um, increased the video note to 30 minutes. And they did this so that faculty members can do little mini lessons now on video notes and post it that way within Brightspace, which is pretty cool. Like we just found out, so I really have nothing else to say about that. We're still, we're going to learn how and, wh- how and where to best use that. But I thought it was a really nice, um, really nice thing for the company. You have a question? Yep. Is the think tank set up via Blackboard's discussion board? Yes, yes. So this is one of those, um, oh, Janice, what's the, Jay, what's the language? These are the topics under a forum. So I set up advanced research think tank as a forum, and then I set up these topics, and then students can start threads under those topics. But yes, um, another really good thing to do uh, is you could just set it up as a, a question cafe or Q&A cafe, and students can just post questions there as they've, as they've got them as well. And then they can answer each other's questions, um, which is really nice. All right. Moving on from this, thank you. Great, great discussion on that and, and great food for thought on that. So the other thing I want to, the, the other principle, the second principle I want to talk about is providing active learning opportunities. Um, and with these active learning opportunities, I'm going to talk about within your class meetings, right, because our policies were doing these synchronous classes. And then we'll talk about within your assignments. There's two different ways to do this. Um, again, I'm going to caution us that we only have a month of class left. So changing up our assignments right now and doing new things to make them more active is probably not the best idea. 
but I think there might be some little things we can do that I want to mention. But within your class meetings, within your lectures, can you look for ways to make your, your um, can you look for opportunities to have engagement triggers that involve active learning? Um, there's a couple ways you can do this. Everybody who was at the workshop earlier this week, you'll, you will recognize we already talked about these right in a previous workshop. And uh, John Finn, if you weren't at that workshop, we have a recording of it and you can get some more details here. But just within your lecture, you can just ask students to put their answers in the chat. Even if you have a big classroom, you could just say, put, okay, so I just talked about this. Throw out the question like you would throw it out in a class meeting and then say, put your, put your responses in the chat. And then you can just kind of scroll and just kind of look, are most of them getting it? Um, what this does is it just re-engages students for a moment in your, what you're talking about and in your lecture. You can always also use features like uh, uh, external features like Poll Everywhere, Kahoot, these different kind of um, polling features that just kind of uh, um, give students questions they can answer on the spot. You can share the results. Um, there's a really nice polling feature within Zoom itself that's really, uh, really easy to use. And if you want more information about that, we can, we can give it to you. We're not doing a hands-on workshop on how to uh, use this technology right at this moment. We're just talking about ways to use this to engage students. But we'd be happy to do, um, so, you know, happy to show you how to use polling in Zoom. It's really easy. You can just do a quick poll and then share the results. Um, and you can also use breakout rooms, which we're gonna do in a second, um, so that you can see what it's like from the student's perspective. But all of those just within your actual class meetings will give you some chance for some active learning. Within the assignments that you've got, think about are there, is there anything you can do with students in the field? And I know we are social distancing, so I'm not saying send them out into <laughs> into the world. What I'm saying is recognize that, that we, we can go beyond our classroom walls now, right? They're not sitting um, in the classroom with us, so we can go beyond our classroom walls. In the, when we did the, this workshop yesterday, we had a bunch of STEM people in there, and one example I use is like, if you're about to talk about a chemical that you know is in some, you know, cleaning product, have students go in the bathroom and get their under the sink and get this cleaning product and read the ingredients, right? Just to kind of give them some context before you move move forward with this. It's just a way to, um, again, engage them. This is what we're doing, we're just trying to engage them in the class. Um, you can have them do internet searches. They've got the technology right there. They've got their phones. You can have them do this on the fly or as part of the assignment. You know, go to the web and see see what's out there. What are people saying about this on social media right now? Amy, I'm thinking about um, your your uh, X core class. What are, you know, what what's being said right now on different things about homelessness. Have them do a little search in their breakout groups and then come back and say what's the most interesting thing you learned um, doing your search that you want to share with the class. Um, you can also uh, utilize um, social media and leverage that. And so create a class hashtag and then have students say, okay, the most interesting thing you learned, the most interesting fact, the most interesting stat, post it on this class hashtag, whether they use Twitter or whatever. Okay, you can do that for this. But those are just ways to think about. Um, we've got them for one more month. What can we do besides make them sit in front of the computer and listen to us, right? Think about how much of that we're doing ourselves in all the different meetings we're in, and they're doing it class after class. And some of them, you know, they planned their classes to be face-to-face, -face, and so some of them did them all in, in a row, so then they have study time on each end or work time on each end, and now they're just sitting in front of the computer one after another after another after another. So finding anything you can do to engage them in the active learning is really powerful. Okay, so the next one is gamifying, and I will turn it over to Jay. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk real quickly about this because, as Elizabeth said, um, it's we've got a month left, and so if you haven't done anything at all ever with with badges, I don't know that now would be a good time to really kind of dive into it too deeply. 
Um, but badges are another way um, of, of, I think, staying in touch with students in, in a slightly different way. And so it's a good thing to think about maybe going forward as well. Um, it is also the kind of thing you could set up pretty quickly to do some, some pretty small stuff. And again, I'm not going to go into the details really of, of all the, the ins and outs of how to do it, but just kind of give you a sense of, of what they are. So badges, you probably got this on something um, else that you're involved in, whether it's, it's some app on your phone um, as, as a form of motivation, or you might get them from some, you know, kind of uh, stores and things like that to kind of try to keep you interested as well, um, where you, you do something, you demonstrate a certain kind of uh, amount of engagement, and then you get a reward, which is a little digital image um, that's your badge, right? Um, a lot of us used to be doing the fit uh, stuff with Fitbit and also constantly kind of, you know, going for the latest reward and award for with the badges with Fitbit. And, and badges in Brightspace work essentially the same way. You as the instructor can set up little triggers um, that give the students um, often automatically, you can do it manually too, but you can also do a lot of them automatically, um, a little, just a little kind of reward, um, which is just this little icon really um, that says, hey, you did a great job doing something here. So you can see on a couple of these, um, I had one from my grammar class last semester. Uh, I called it the early talker badge. You know, so if they posted to the discussion boards um, either before the first day of class, which I asked them to do in kind of a little welcome video, um, or immediately after the first day of class, um, I gave them a special little badge just for being somebody who got in there right away and got involved, right? And I set it up ahead of time. And then if they did it, they got the the, the badge, right? And if they didn't do it, they didn't get the badge, right? Um, but if you think about it as kind of a different form of communication, um, in that it's a tri it's communication triggered by specific actions, usually positive actions that you want the students to take. Um, it's it's an interesting way to kind of stay in touch with them in a different way, right? Um, and all they do when they get the badge, the next time they log in the bright space, they just kind of get a pop up window that says, "Hey, you've earned the early talker badge. Congratulations!" Right? Um, you can write them a little note or something along those lines. So badges are an interesting way to do that. And like I said, they're pretty easy to set up at a very basic level. Um, <clears throat> they can be used in a much more kind of complex way, but like I said, it's, it's, it's a bit late in the semester to be thinking about it in those terms, right? But that is another way to stay in touch with them on, on kind of an ongoing basis. But like I said, the nice difference here is that it's individualized to the students and it's based solely on their um, specific actions that they take within Brightspace. Um, another key point um, with, uh, that, that Elizabeth raised from that uh, message from Brightspace is this idea of, of timely and useful feedback, which is really, I think, even more critical now than it was in the past, right? Um, and making sure whenever students are giving us any kind of work, um, we're giving them some kind of, of um, fairly quick but also helpful um, feedback on what they've done, um, even if it's just a check plus to say, hey, you did a great job and kind of explaining what that great job entails um, is, is useful. Um, one way to do that in Brightspace, obviously, is with rubrics, especially if you're doing kind of larger assignments. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into the details of setting these up, but um, they're pretty straightforward. They do make grading, I think, a whole lot easier. Um, and as you can see here, you can use them pretty, if you use them in a thorough way, you're providing the students with kind of a constant stream of feedback um, automatically just based on how they did so that when the student looks at the paper, they don't say, why did I get a 75%? They look at the paper and say, why did I do so poorly on that integration component of the paper, right? And so right there, you're kind of cutting through a lot of the kind of uh, unnecessary part of the discussion you want to have with them and getting at the real meat of the discussion, right? You can kind of hone in right away. You have a question from yep. Ava. She's saying, I think she's saying, how do you set up the badges? How to set the badges in Brightspace help? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, if you want to play with them a little bit, um, it, they're tucked away a little bit. So you go to the activities menu in Brightspace and then you select awards from that menu, and that takes you to what's called uh, badges and certificates. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to kind of how to do it, but once you learn how to do it, it's pretty easy to do. And if you're interested, um, we can set up a little time, you know, later on in the week or something, and I can kind of walk you through uh, some of that. Yeah, well, let me reiter reiterate that. Any of these, any of these features that we point out that you want to learn uh, hands-on how to do, just let us know. 
and Janice just placed a link in the chat um, for badges and how to go through the awards tool. So I think you'll find that tip very helpful. Um, so that link is there. And also um, Amy had a question. What's the best D2L resource to share with students instructing them on how to see their feedback? I constantly find out that I've used rubrics and comments and mm -hmm. students have never mm -hmm. seen them. I can't see that they see, so it's hard to explain. Uh, can, yeah, that's that. Uh, oh, go on, go on. Well, I was just say, in Janice, in, in, the, in the Brightspace documents in CAT, so Janice, uh, you know, just, just your Brightspace documents in the CAT Food blog, if you can put the link there, where all of the documents are at the very end, there's a whole slew of documents for students. So um, Janice will give you the link, and then at the bottom there, there's a whole slew, and you can just cut and paste those and email them to your students, and it's got, uh, yeah, so there it is, right there in the mute, in the, in the mute, in the chat. Yeah, and, um, oh, sorry, I was just gonna add real quick. It, you can always, if you go into the submissions where you're using, let's say, a rubric, you can see if the student has read the feedback. Yeah. Maybe you're doing that already. You know, you can see the student will sit read feedback on so and so. But yeah, there's a number of students who, even if you tell them in class to go to it right there, they're they're not interested unless it's just the number. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that's what we're yeah. I, th I think it's just kind of teaching them. The main thing is if they learn how to go to that that uh, submissions page. Um, Brightspace has also made it a little easier to get some of this stuff from the grade book as well, um, so that they can kind of link back to it. So, so a lot of the feedback carries over now. Um, and so I think just kind of showing them once or twice. One of the big things we've found is that a lot of people just aren't using grades in, in Brightspace. And then so the students in a lot of their classes just aren't used to looking uh, for it. Um, so if you just kind of show them once, um, I usually do that on the first or second day of class or usually with the first assignment. So here's how you get to this stuff. Here's how you can see the rubric breakdown. Here's how you can see my feedback from it um, as well. But uh, like Elizabeth said, the, the resources Janice has posted also kind of give the students uh, some help with, with finding this stuff on their own as well. Okay, um, another way to provide feedback, especially for any kind of uh, uh, submission, any sort of assignments that they submit to you, um, is to use the annotation tools that are now built into Brightspace. Um, again, this was one thing that was lacking when we switched over to Brightspace uh, only two or so years ago um, that, that uh, there were some complaints about, but uh, they added it pretty quickly after that. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty useful tool. Um, it's primarily for text-based stuff, but even if students were turning in like uh, an image or an infographic or something, you could still add these little notes um, to it. Um, uh, or you can circle stuff, you can, you can draw on it, um, you can do all sorts of things to it. So it's a great way to kind of give them some quick and very specific feedbacks. So instead of saying, oh, remember in that paragraph at the end of your paper, you said this. Let's put a little note next to that paragraph and say, hey, um, this paragraph, you know, does a really nice job with this or highlight a sentence, it's a great job, you know, really, really clear sentence like that. You can get really specific the same way you can if you're marking it up um, as a hard copy. And another way to do uh, timely and useful feedback is to use that video notes tool that Elizabeth mentioned. Um, and this is something I've started relying on a lot in the last couple of years um, because I hate typing those, those end notes. Um, I'm kind of a slow typer. Um, it takes, takes a long time and I kind of, I end up kind of dwelling too much on what I'm saying and I'd spend 20, 30 minutes just trying to write like one little note to a student. Um, so I'm not sure what's going to happen now that I have 30 minutes with these things because one of the advantages of the video note was was that I only had three minutes. Um, and so I would, I would, as I was reading the student's paper, I would jot down on, on a little um, sticky note, like the three or four main points I wanted to get across. Um, and then I would do that and I'd have that little clock ticking down for three minutes. Um, but then the video note is, is there. And the research, um, which came out you know, a couple of years ago, was actually saying that students, this generation of students, was much more likely to pay attention to either audio or video feedback from the professor as opposed to written feedback. Uh, and that may continue to be the case. We'll kind of see what, what kind of disruption 
um, all of this is to that kind of thing. Um, but I found it to be a much more effective way. You just have to be a little more careful about where you're doing your grading. If you're trying to do it in the coffee shop, it's a little hard to, to produce kind of, kind of clear, um, easy to hear three minute videos. But if you can, we all have these nice home offices now, uh, thanks to this. So um, it might be a little more effective way to do it. Um, all right. Um, so here, okay. So the last principle, and then let's get in breakout rooms and do that. And you'll see what it's like from the student experience. Um, so the last principle that we do want to mention is um, improving course accessibility. This is not something to just give service to. Our courses should be accessible to all students. Um, we need to think about uh, those who might have visual impairments or colorblindness or hearing difficulties or um, you know any of the any other kind of learning uh, learning accommodations that they need. Right now, I understand that we are in <laughs> remote emergency mode, and so um, it's hard to attend to this. We're just trying to learn how to actually do our classes like this. But as we move forward, I think uh, being really aware that our classes should be accessible. Um, asking students, is anybody having any trouble? Just let me, you know, with any of this. If, if you feel like the class is not accessible to you in any way, let me know. And just being aware, aware of this. Um, this is just an accessibility checklist. I took a screenshot off online, but we do, there, there are a ton of best practices and better practices for this. And we just need to keep that in the back of our minds. Um, our videos, are they uh, closed captioned? You know, if students are in a situation where they don't have fancy headphones, can they really hear us well? Um, there's all kinds of things there to consider kind of moving forward. So I mentioned that here to, to um, at this point, I think the best we can do is ask students, uh, you know, are you having accessibility issues? And then treat them on a one-to-one -one basis. All right, so now I want to get into, I want to show you uh, breakout rooms. Um, what we're going to have, what we're going to do is we're going to get into small groups um, and you're going to have five minutes. I, I use the host, I'll time you and I'll let you know when your time's running down. And I want you to consider one or two of the principles we've talked about. I've listed them here for your convenience. Um, consider one of the two principles we've talked about and um, what you have done or you can do to encourage student engagement through one of these principles. Think about um, uh, what we, the point of this workshop, right, is engaging students while we're teaching them remotely. So think about these and anything you've done that's related to any of these that you either have done that could, that could encourage engagement or that you could do uh, moving forward. Once you get into your groups, whoever has the birthday closest to today, so that's either forward or backwards, um, you get to be the spokesperson when you come out of your groups. Okay, here we go. Uh, keep teaching Zula. Please go to this website. We are updating this website daily. It's in all of our email signatures. You can just click on it from there if you don't want to bookmark it, but bookmark it. Um, it's really, um, we're up to updating it daily. And then as you are finding things you'd like us to put on it, please let us know and please keep sharing with us. Uh, Tier, you want to say about the evaluations? You want to so we'll let Tiara close it out. So yes, um, shortly after we end this workshop, you will be receiving via email an evaluation. It'll only take you a couple of minutes, and we both appreciate and need your feedback. So thank you.